Samba draws here again with the Cypher Unlimited crew. We have our usual suspects of Spigs18 or Anthony. We have AD or Alpha Dean or simply Dean. And uh, Dean, what are we doing here today? Well, you know, tonight we have an up and coming rising star in the RPG world, writing world, all that good stuff. None, And they are none other than uh, Dominique Dickey, writer, editor, cultural consultant, theater, stage manager. I mean, she wears a lot. They wear lots of hats, excuse me. And, you know, we're just here to talk about things. You know, I do love the one title she takes on. They take on the uh, RPG Hooligan. That's an <laughs> awesome title, you know. So without further ado, Anthony. Hey, Dominique, welcome. We're so happy to have you on the CU. Thank you for having uh, me. You know, when um, Dean told me that uh, we possibly might be able to get get you on, um, I was pretty excited because he told me the same day I read your adventure. So oh. I was already psyched from reading the adventure. And then I was like, oh no, Dominique's gonna be on, this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, first, welcome, welcome to the CEO, CU, and could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and how did you get into role playing games? Yeah, um, I'm a writer, editor, and consultant working in fiction and RPGs. Um, I love anything that has to do with space, pirates, or zombies. Um, and I got into RPGs uh, during my orientation to university. Uh, I started college. I'd always wanted to play RPGs like throughout high school, but just wasn't in with the right crowd. And like none of my friends wanted to like humor me and play RPGs, RPGs with me. Um, and then within a couple days of moving to college, some of my friends were like, "Hey, we're playing D and D. Do you want?" And I was like, "Like, like sparkles and hard eyes." Like, <laughs> when I like, of course I want in. Um, and from there, started writing content. Just. Um, because like there were stories that I wanted to see told that I didn't see um, that already existed in the world, um, especially involving space pirates and zombies. Um, and ended up uh, doing an internship at MCG, which was a really good launching point for the rest of my career. And I've been doing a lot of freelance work ever since. You had me at zombies, because... And for me, space pirates. Because I, I actually do have a one-shot that's for space pirates. But um, you did mention it, though. Um, you know, you worked, you interned at Monty Cook Games, you know. So how did you land that gig as an academic intern for them at Monty Cook Games? And uh, what were some of, your, ah, some of your responsibilities there? Um, a mentor of mine reached out and pointed out that they were looking for applicants to make and encouraged me to apply. Um, I applied, I interviewed with uh, Monty and Shauna, which was super intimidating, um, but they're like so sweet and got the job, which was a very, a very good turn of fate for me. Um, and my responsibilities, I did a lot of shadowing people in different departments to get a feel for the different work that goes into running that sort of company. I also did a lot of um, like auxiliary layout work, like hyperlinking and bookmarking the PDFs, like the consumer PDFs. So when you go in the sidebar and see like the hyperlink that goes to um, every different section of the, like a consumer PDF, I did some of that. Um, I also wrote an adventure, wrote a web article um, and did some editing work. Nice. That's just like awesome. And just so you know, it was actually Shauna who kind of put the bug in my ear to get you on the show. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yes. She was our last interview love- for you. Great. So yeah. If you get a chance, take a look at it. That was our last yeah. interview for you. But- I, I, I want to ask a question going back. I, in the Darcy interview, you said that uh, was Cyberpunk your first role playing game? Is that true? Uh- I started with D and D, and then from there jumped to Cyberpunk, and then from there Cyber System. Oh, that's yeah. a big jump. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've been all over the place. Cyberpunk is awesome, but that's the best way to be: be all over the place. And speaking of being all over the place, you wrote this excellent adventure, High Stone Miracle Four for MCG. Can you tell us a little bit about the adventure and what made you choose the Stars of Fire to adventure in? Yeah, it's a time-limited heist on a space station in which the players are attempting to steal proof of alien life and find something a little bit unexpected. Um, And I wrote it because I had been really wanting to run 
a space heist for a specific group of friends that I often game with um, and had been looking for a while for the right system to write it in. And I got an advanced PDF of the Stars Are Fire because that product launched while I was working at MCG um, and was reading through it and was immediately like, oh, like this is the, the system that I need to tell this story in. And from there, it was a pretty rapid process of saying like, I have this idea that I really had just for myself and wanted to do for my friends, but because I'm learning about all of the different steps that go into creating a game product, could I use this as like a way to build more experience of like learning what it takes to write something, shadowing on the editing of that product, doing the layout myself, doing the hyperlinking and bookmarking myself and like helping with the marketing of it and getting to follow a complete product from start to finish to cap off my internship. Um, and everyone on everyone at MCG was on board with that idea and was uh, really looking at it as like a growth opportunity for me, which it was, and I got to learn a lot by doing it. And then from there, um, I got the go to start writing and just made it happen. Yeah, I was just gonna ask, did, did you have to do um, a formal pitch? You know, like, hey, this is my adventure. Let me, let me uh, pitch it to Monty and Shauna. I um, had a meeting with Bruce actually and okay, we sense. talked through it because he wrote the stars are fire and mm -hmm. i was like hey i have this idea for your product um and i had to like sell him on it um and he had some really valid concerns because the initial direction i was going in wasn't actually really going to work with like the time mechanics um and then from there um i worked with i worked first most closely with bruce on like ideating and writing and then with worked with shauna on editing it and then after we'd done a high level editorial pass was when it went to Monty for like final approval to be an official MCG product um, to determine if it would come out through MCG or if I would just have it for myself. Um, and then Monty approved it to go up on the web store. Um, and that was basically around the end of my internship, yeah. Oh, that's all I have to, I do have to tell you one thing about uh, that particular adventure. Um, it runs beautifully. I don't know how many times you've gotten to run it, but I actually ran it a couple of days ago. That's you know, so cool. For some guys at work, we actually had some downtime at work and I was like, you know what? The best way to learn about it is let me run it. And it actually runs great. So good job, good job. Thank you. I've run it like five or six times because um, due to current events, I've been trying to create space for black gamers to have some escapism and like what better escapism is there than fucking shit up in space, you know? So, um, I've been, I have this just ongoing offer on Twitter that if you're a black gamer and you want me to run it for you, DM me and I'll run it for you. Like, no questions asked. Um, That's awesome. I, I, was, I was also going to say that it's also worth noting that, um, I don't know if it still is, but I know all the original um, copies, the proceeds went to BLM. Yeah. It was yeah. only for the month of June, but the proceeds for the first 1,000 copies that sold in the month of June went to BLM. And I actually had a hand in like picking the, the charity. It went to the, oh, that's awesome. not the national org, the Los Angeles chapter specifically, because I'm from LA. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, but I'm really curious to hear from other people who have run it because I've run it like like I wrote it with a group of friends in mind. So I ran it for that group of friends early in the playtesting process. And then I've run it for like a bunch of strangers from the internet with just trying to like create a playful and safe space for black people in the past month and a half, two months or so, um, which is an ongoing offer. If anyone wants to take me up on that, I will run it again. I love running it. Real quick. Um, I'm sorry. No, go for it. You could always run it for one black person and two Puerto Ricans for the right. <laughs> <laughs> And that's the other thing I was going to ask you. Are you are you on our server? Are you on Cypher Unlimited? I'm not, but that's simply because I don't like Discord. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's not, uh, that's an understandable uh, stance to take off. Uh, yeah. Um, but before it's we really go, me. Oh, okay. just, just so you know, we do have like 3,200 people out there who would. Be probably more than happy to meet you know somebody a little bit of celebrity <laughs> that's a just a 
sticky little, little pump. <laughs> and real yeah. quick, before we go on to the next question, um, I just wanted to say that, you know, just to go back a little bit, uh, the fact that, you know, the options when you were creating um, the heist game were, um, you know, if it was good enough, it would be an MCG store. If not, it would be, you know, published, you know, personally, whatever have you. It's a huge testament to you that Monty was like, you know what, let's put it in the store. You know, that's just, that's just awesome. <laughs> I was like the entire time that I knew that Monty had it. There were like two days where Shauna was like, I'm from, there were two days in between Shauna saying, so our next step is to submit to Monty and Monty like getting back to me about like approving of it. And I just held my breath. <laughs> I was like, I want this so badly. Like, I don't know what I'll do if he doesn't like it. I worked so hard on this. Um, and I was just so proud of myself. But that's, that was a personal high point of my life. And you should be, yeah, so most far. definitely. You know, you 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 were proud of yourself, but just so you know, we're proud of you too. Thank you. Know, you. Thank you're you. You're very much an inspiration. Trust me. Thank <laughs> you. So, um, how was it the experience designing an adventure for MCG? And you know, what are some of the advantages, or if any, disadvantages to write, writing an adventure for a modular system like the Cypher system? Um, I'm not sure if it's specific to the Cypher system as so much as it is with writing an adventure for publication rather than writing content for like a campaign that I'm running myself. But when I'm running a campaign for like, like I'm running an ongoing campaign right now that uses the cyber system um, for just a group of friends and that like I can run a three hour session off of like four or five Rapid. points and a random name generator, right? But writing for strangers is a lot of not only laying out the plot and the NPCs, but also like explaining how you think, which is why it ended up being just like 13 pages of me clarifying myself all the time. <laughs> and not, whereas when I write stuff for myself, it's just like, here's an NPC name, here's a single trait about the NPC, here's a single location, and just like take it around with it. Like, I don't know, I ran a thing last night that was just like me BSing for three hours because I went into it with like half a page of notes and like so underprepared. Um, but writing for publication is like, you have to aggressively like justify your choices in a way that prepares a GM who isn't familiar with how you think to run this game. That's definitely yeah. an out. I was gonna say, I could totally get your point because I'll run a game on a napkin and I'll have some scribbles and to me it'll make a total sense, you know, and someone else will look at it and be like, what does green swamp people mean? And I'm like, that's that's my whole first two scenes of the adventure. What are you talking about? Yeah, I was basically going to say something of a similar effect where um, I didn't even consider the fact that, you know, someone looking at my notes would have to consider my thought process. Where is a similar thing? Well, I'll just write a big robotic guy, angry, has fish. Like, that. Yeah. Like that's all I write. Like... <laughs> But it makes sense yeah, to me probably, mentally. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, well, I think that's for any of us, and because Cypher is so modular and so easy to run. I mean, I ran um, Unmasked. I ran a what? A, a, a year of school in six sessions. <laughs> you know, and yeah. the notes were one page. <laughs> and it's so easy to improv for. It's so easy to to you know you set a target number. If, if someone, you know, you have a random NPC or a random baddie, you set a target number, that's pretty much it. Off you go, you know? Yeah, I try to think, like, for me, thinking of an NPC, I, I, ha I, I run games, like, off my computer. Like, I use my laptop as a GM screen and have everything open on my computer. And one of the things that I always have open is, like, a name generator. And thinking of an NPC is just generate name, choose number. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. yeah. It's and so I think, good. like one unique thing about them as a person like maybe they like really want a pizza i don't know like like, <laughs> the, like i don't like jane doe target like jane doe level six really wants a pizza that's an yeah. and, and that's yeah. the beauty of the uh the npc decks like they're essentially mm -hmm. just that it's a name like an alternate version of the name that's more modern or something and mm -hmm. then like a couple of traits and a level and it's you mm -hmm. know it's just awesome yeah um, but speaking of um, working for Cypher System or gaming or, you know, your gaming work in general, um, you've also worked on a board game called Sea of Legends from Guildhall yeah. Studios. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what you did for the game? 
Yeah, so Sea of Legends is a game about maritime exploration in the Caribbean. Um, there's a set of NPCs that involve zombies, which immediately had me interested. Um, and it is a board game with an integrated app, and the app has adventures in it. And those adventures are more similar to video game writing than to, than to like traditional RPG writing that I've done before. Um, but it, so it's a lot of like decision trees, and you take an action, and there are two potential paths that action could lead you down. So all the writing that I've done for that has been based on um, like the decision trees from like Bandersnatch, if you've seen the Black Mirror episode. Yeah, um, yeah it's um, a lot of work like that of like writing like 1500 words a pop of variable decisions. And there will be a total of like 400 adventures in the final game. Um, that kickstarted recently. I've written a couple of adventures for it and I'm working on some more um keep your eye out for pirate content because pirate content and zombie content because i've been writing pirate zombies <laughs> nice that's awesome it, it's fully kickstarted is it um does it have a release date or is it out yet i'm actually not sure i um can get back to you on that but i if i don't remember off my head and we'll definitely be I sure to it, include a link, you know, to the Kickstarter if it's still active or whatever. Or even if it's not, we'll still I include information. I think it's still active, and if not, there's a website. Um, but yeah, that funded pretty recently and was super exciting. Um, yeah, I was gonna say I got, I got, I got, I got to see the list of names. There was a some pretty talent. There was a pretty talented group of people working on that project. People that I'm so honored to be working with, like they're people that. Um, that I'm not like personally friends with, that I aspire to be friends with. And I'm like, we're on a project together. I have an in now, we can be friends. Yeah. <laughs> like people That's that awesome. are like in the industry who I just really want to get to know. I definitely that know that awesome. feeling. That's yeah, pretty, that was pretty tight. Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> now we, I was just looking on Twitter the other day and I saw you were designing a game called Trial. Yeah. You know, how, of course, you know, we talked a little bit before you came on, but can you tell our, our viewers a little bit about the game? And uh, if you definitely have any room for us to play test, you know, we'd be interested in that too. <laughs> yeah, um, Trial is a game that a friend of mine has described as mock trial, but with dice mechanics. Um, the players play um, witnesses in a murder trial, collaboratively telling the story of what happened the night of the murder. And then players decide based on the story that they've collaboratively created if the defendant is guilty or not. And it is a death penalty trial of a black man for the murder of a white woman and plays with um, racial biases and the way that race informs how people are tried and sentenced because over 50% of wrongfully convicted death row is on a race of black. Um, so there are sort of two modes of play that you can take. You can create a utopian world in which the uh, NPC on trial is given a fair trial and treated justly, or you can play um, in a more educational mode where you recreate the conditions of reality and then investigate what has led us to those conditions and how we can change them. Um, so it's not really like a fun game in the traditional sense, but I want it to be interesting and educational. And I'm pretty full up on play testers for my initial post on Twitter, but I do have room for y'all if you want to play. <laughs> uh, but like, more broadly, um, I'm not <coughs> looking at days. Um, and that should be coming out on itch um, in like mid to late August. Oh, that's awesome. Awesome stuff. It, it, it sounds like, a, you know, a for the queen, but with more of a social take of, you know, yeah. spe especially in modern time, you know, the, the day and age we're living in now. I think which makes it even more of important to have a game like this out. I'm, it's, I'm really uh, intrigued. That I mean, it sounds like an awesome game. Sounds Thank intense. You. Sounds yeah. intense. You know, seriously. Yeah, I definitely expect play to be um, emotional and a growth experience, but not the most comfortable experience. So I'm looking, especially like in going into play testing. I'm starting play testing in like a week a week or so. And I'm really looking for feedback on how to make it a like safe and good experience um, while also rewarding players for engaging with difficult topics. Because like if you're playing, um, like someone's gonna have to play a racist. Like 
there's going to be a witness who has some sort of conscious or unconscious bias against the defendant. Um, and it's, I'm wondering like, how do you reward players for acting in that way, but also make it distinct, like a distinction between acting as a character and acting as yourself? And how do I not replicate problematic power dynamics at the table? Uh, this definitely Probably seems good. like, uh, you know, a complex series of, uh, I don't even know what to call it, but it's definitely like, even though as hard as some, putting out something like this is, is like Anthony said, especially right now during these times, it's super important that people yeah. see that perspective or what have you. Yeah. Well, it's well, not in perspective. People see the reality yeah. of... Well, that's what I'm saying. I commend you for even being brave enough to do something like that because... I'm a black man, you know, and, uh, you know, I mean, these guys have dealt with, you know, their own versions of what we go through, but, you know, just to, just to think about something like that, being out there to try to educate people and give them perspectives, um, you know, because I do appreciate those people, you know, they're, you know, our allies, you know, our, our Caucasian people who will say, you know, I don't understand it, you know. And I can appreciate that. I can accept that better than you trying to tell me, you know, how to be a black man in America, yeah. <laughs> you know? So awesome. Once again, I, I'm probably gonna use that word a lot when I refer to you, Dominique, it's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Know? Yeah. So. Yeah, and we definitely want to be on that list for play testing, so we'll work something out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that. <laughs> All right, so um, not only are you a game designer, a writer, a stage producer, editor, a college student. When are you graduating, by the way? Or I have graduate, you graduated? No, I graduate in May of 2021. Oh, awesome. Almost there. About a year left. Almost there. I also, I also heard from a little birdie, Darcy, <laughs> <laughs> that you're a kick-ass GM. So oh, I try. You, <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about you know, what you're running now? And do you have any advice for our listeners who want to start GMing or some pro or if they want some pro tips? Yeah, I'm currently running a a, a campaign that started with the MCG product, Dread Expectations. It's an instant adventure with superheroes. Um, and it's meant to be run as a one shot, but I extended it into like five or six sessions. I'm currently three sessions deep and it's we, we're going to keep going. Um, I'm running that for some friends of mine. It is a whole lot of fun. Um, and I, I think my advice for like new GMs, something that was really helpful for me is um, trust that your players will stay engaged if you need to pause. There's a lot of pressure to keep talking and to keep the story going, but it's okay to say like, if someone does something that challenges the way that you prepared, or someone does something that takes you off script and you like actually need a moment to bless yourself, I, will not hesitate to say, oh, let me think about that and then proceed to take a second and think about it and take a moment to like recenter myself and think, well, how am I gonna recalibrate for this narrative choice that takes me totally off of what I prepared? Um, because I think that like you can let the table sit in silence for a solid 90 seconds and people will just entertain themselves. Like it's, it, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of a lot of like new GMs feel pressure to constantly be on and entertaining, but you can take a moment for yourself and not totally ruin the atmosphere. Um, and that's been valuable for me with like, I'm still a pretty new GM. I've only been GMing for the past like year or so. And that's pretty valuable for me with like being able to take things in stride. If someone does something that totally throws me off, I say, I'm going to need to think about that. And I take a minute and think about it. Nice. I mean, that's phenomenal advice. I tell that to people all the time. You know, you don't always have to be on the, like, and you don't always have to have the answer. Yeah, okay. you can just say, I don't know. Like, yeah. or say like, you can try, wanna roll for it and find out. And then while they're rolling, you spot yourself 30 seconds to think. Yeah. Oh, one of our favorites is when they ask you a question, you you spin the question back at them. Like, you know, be like, hey, what's this guy doing? I don't know, what is he doing? Yeah, I've gotten more into, um, I'm playing a, a streamed campaign that starts without number right now. And Mad J, he's at Mad J on Twitter, is GMing that and he's phenomenal. It's something that I've learned from him is just giving players more control of what the story looks like. Um, so you don't have to always think of everything. You can say like, here's an NPC name, named Jane Doe 
now so-and-so gamer at the table, what does Jane Doe look like? Or like, what's her deal? What does she want from you? What is she doing? Um, and you can still like be driving the narrative or like narratively in control while giving players these small decisions and handing off the small decisions frees you up to have the brain power to make the big decisions. You know, you, and you said something really good there, Dominique, you know, it's something that I do a lot, especially in like campaigns. I build frameworks. I don't build, uh, you know, the whole everything out. And I have the players fill in those blanks. You know, like you said, just giving them some more agency, giving them those little plot points to fill in for you. You know, one of the things that I love to do, especially if I know my running campaign, is I always like to have like a background. You know, guys, give me a give me a, a paragraph background story or something. You know, and that's always become that becomes my extra notes. That becomes the extra paper at the desk. You know, so good stuff. Awesome. Something that happened even in. Um... In, in a session I was running last night that one of my players said like, in character, I think I would know a social worker and I think that it's time to go talk to that social worker about what's happening with this plot. And I said, okay, you know this social worker, what's her name, what does she look like, how do you know her? Now, I don't have to think of that backstory because I've handed it off to the player and the player gets agency over their character's backstory and their character's connections. There you go. Uh, oh, 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 sorry. Oh, it just it gives the player authority, but it also means that I don't have to do the work. Exactly. <laughs> and I was going to say, on top of that, it's kind of built right into Cypher System with player intrusions. They could have been like, yeah. here's here's one. E oh, wait, I don't know if it's the same game you're playing, or I, you meant to no, start yeah, numbers. Okay, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like, hey, here's an EXP player intrusion. I know a social worker. Like, it just, it's it's awesome to see players fill in those gaps in the stories. And again, we do it all the time. And it, it's like you said. It's, there's nothing wrong with being quiet for 30, 40 seconds while your players come up with these details or role play with each other about yeah. what's being brought up. But it's just awesome to see that at the table because, again, it engages them. Like, it makes them more in character, blah, blah, blah. Again, you don't have to be always on. Just give them that opportunity for them to be on while you're thinking. Yeah. <laughs> I love doing that. It's It's like what keeps me sane as a GM. I don't think I would have made it as far as GM without the ability to just take a pause and hand decisions off to players. And and I like, all, you, as, as I like to tell all you new, young, wonderful people coming into the industry, into the games, enjoy this platinum age. Oh my God, enjoy this platinum age. Just, uh, uh, Anthony and I come from that old place when it was still kind of the thought process was the DM versus the players. Yeah. You know? It was always so much work. It was crazy, you know, and then some of the systems and everything else. This Platinum Age, I'm loving it. <laughs> I really uh -oh. try not to be, like, adversarial, too. Like, I don't want to be working against the players. I want to be, like, on their side. And I think that giving them narrative control makes it more like we're all on the same team and less, like, I'm behind this, like, shroud of mystery and I have all the answers, but you can't have them. Um, cause like as a player, I hate when people do that. I hate when it's like the GM knows everything and you selectively get information parceled out to you and you don't get to play a part in like what that information is. That's like my I, big I, player. You, you also get enjoyment as a GM from their successes. You know, yeah. you, you get to share the triumphs of the, the player characters, you know, and it's, so when they succeed, it's almost like, even though you're the GM setting the stage, it's almost like you succeed yourself as well. You know, it's a group storytelling game. You know, yeah. I always feel like I want tasks to be hard enough to, like, I want tasks to be hard enough to be fun, but I want my players to succeed regardless. Like, I don't want to put them up against, like, a boss they can't take down, you know? Because, like, I think there are some GMs that are like, if you die, then I win, which, like, <laughs> if your players die, no one wins. No one wins yeah. anyway. It's not, like, a matter of winning or losing. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. Well, that's not to say that character death doesn't have its place in certain stories. Yeah, I will just say that. <laughs> oh, you know what? My thing is zombie that I've games. Always, I've always said, I've always said that, you know, players only die in my games if they bring it on themselves. You know, it's normally their choice. I mean, even like in the zombie game that we play with Anthony, you have to play in Anthony's zombie game. Play, he has a, a great one. You know, called God doesn't love us anymore. You'll love it. But it is literally like being in the middle of a of a of a Romero movie, you know. It's 
Night of the Living Dead or Dawn of the Dead right on a on the Intrepid. Yeah. It's awesome, you know, and it's so much fun. I really want to get more into horror games as well. Um, I did the hyperlinking and bookmarking on Stay Alive, the MTG horror supplement. So good. But I haven't actually like played very many horror games and I really like getting to read through as I was hyperlinking and bookmarking of like all of the tips how to run a horror game just makes me want to be in one. But I haven't gotten to it yet. Well, come on over. We've got a few for you. Okay. Stay, stay Alive is my absolute favorite book. Okay. I, I, I'm a zombie nut, so it's like, it, you know, it was like, uh, you know, it was like giving me a, a box of cupcakes or something yeah. on my birthday. You know? That book is just brilliant. I read that book twice in the first night. The mm. PDF, I read the PDF twice in the first night. That's how good it was to me. It's fantastic. You know? It's like, and, it's so smart. Yeah, you know, and I ran a couple of horror adventures based out of it. They both went great. Anthony's done some stuff, so yeah. I really want to use the vampire setting and stay alive. And what I like the most about it is that you run it like it's it's supposed to be based in a city, but you if there's not a city specifically given that you run it in, you run it like in a city that you feel comfortable with or that you know. And I feel like like I'm living in Baltimore now, but I grew up in LA, and I feel like I have the base knowledge to like run a game set in LA. And then I have like the nostalgia factor of like, oh, this is where I grew up and I get to run a game set there, you know? <laughs> I, be I base a lot of my games in New York City is just because I'm comfortable with it and I can improv on the fly because I know street yeah. names and areas. Yes. It's just easier. Yeah. I'm currently running my, my I'm currently running something that the one I've been talking about that I'm running is based in New York. Um, I don't know shit about New York. <laughs> I to figure out a way to get my players to LA. And last night, I finally made up a reason. Like, you have to go to LA to, to, to fight this evil monster. Uh, you're superheroes, and there's a monster in LA that you have to go fight. And now we're on my turf, and now I can just improvise. And I'm like, yeah. I know exactly where you are, exactly what you're doing. But in New York, I was just like, I had to like pull up a map. I had to like Google stuff on the like, and pick stuff up. Like, yeah. I, like I had to make up a hospital, and I was like, New York Presbytery? And that's an actual <laughs> hospital, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> like, that sounds right. <laughs> when, when you're in your hometown, you could name the local bodega. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, straight, I was like, y'all want to go get tacos? Here's a taco. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we all do that, because I live in Buffalo, but I'm like 10 minutes from Niagara Falls, so I know Buffalo, Niagara Falls. I know all the surrounding areas. Yeah. So I run like games based on like the the Great Lakes and all kinds of stuff, you know, because I know the area. But it, I think that's just something natural for all of us to do, which is yeah. pretty cool. Most definitely. Oh, uh, before we move on to the last question, supers is so fun on Cypher System, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's so easy. Power shifts are the best. I love power shifts. My players don't take enough advantage of power shifts, but like as a GM, I love them. Yeah. It's yeah. such a great mechanic. <laughs> Yeah. We've had so much fun with power shifts and so much fun with supers. You know, that's see where he's the the, the zombie guy. That's my wheelhouse. Super Superheroes. Yeah. Hands down, I will run supers all day long till I'm blue in the face. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was, I didn't think it'd be my thing until I started running it, and I'm having a good time with it. But I I normally go in more for like maritime stuff or space stuff or you know, like zombie stuff, but I, I have no experience running horror games. So uh, not I've got a superhero horror game. I, I was like, you would have loved my game because my game is on a ship fighting yeah. zombies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I need that in my life. Not Please. just any ship, though. What is it, like a naval uh, battle cruiser, it's basically? It's a, a military museum that's an aircraft carrier in the middle of my hand, and everyone's held up on this aircraft carrier surround, surrounded by zombies. I love that. I... <laughs> I want that in my life, please. <laughs> it's super yeah. fun. And, and, and then, like I said, I have superheroes in space or, you know, a superhero horror game in space. So you, you, we got you covered. All the things I love. Yeah. <laughs> we got you covered. Um, but yeah, um, you know, uh, what you call it. We kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, but being a non-binary person of color in the gaming industry who is also researching representation of non-normative genders in science fiction, could, yeah. could you tell us a little bit about why it's so important to have representation for people of color and the LGBTQ plus community in the gaming industry and just media in general? 
I think because um, people of color and queer people have the most narrative authority when it comes to making games that represent these identities. And if you don't get to see your identity in the fiction that you create and the games that you play, then you're lost. Like, and part of why my research is on non-normative genders in science fiction is because science fiction is my favorite genre to read. And this project, my thesis, um, my undergrad thesis came out of looking for characters like me in the books that I read and wanting to um, enter the tabletop game space and like gaming more broadly came out of looking for the opportunities to play characters like myself in the games that I play and opportunities to create games that embody unique experiences that I've had. Um, like, I think that like, even going back to my game trial, like it would never have occurred to me to create that if I were any other race. Um, it would never, I would never would have seen the importance of it or the value of it. And I never would have had the lived experience to um, create it in a safe and ethical way. Um, and that goes for like fiction that I've written about being trans or like um, my research that is about my gender. Um, I think that if you want to see content that reflects diverse identities, then you need diverse creators to make that stuff, which is why it's important like that I'm out here making content. I, I was wondering when you were doing your research for your um, paper, right? Yeah. Is science fiction behind the curve when it comes to representation? Or is it, you know, it's somewhere in the middle or I'd say co compared to other forms of literature? I'd say science fiction is ahead of the curve, but it depends on where you look. There's a lot of, sci I think that science fiction um, imagines technology before it exists. Like a lot of technological innovations that we have in 2020 have been preceded by science fiction from even a hundred years ago. And the same goes for soft sciences like sociology or anthropology that the ways that we understand people are also preceded by thinking about those people in fiction. So there's like books and short stories that are like about imagining racial equity or racial equality, about imagining like gender equity that, and I, I think that, and the premise of my thesis is that if you can't interact with these topics and imagine equality and equity and justice in fiction, which is a relatively low stakes environment, then you can't get close to them in real life. I think that we have to be able to see these things in fiction before we can actualize them because fiction is like the template for how we live. Um, and in that sense, science fiction is ahead of the curve because science fiction is preceding change that I would hope to see in real life. Like if you look at, um, there's an anthology called Meanwhile Elsewhere, that's science fiction by transgender writers. There's the, transcend the, the Transcendent Anthology series, which is three years. It's a yearly anthology of the year's best transgender speculative fiction. There's um, Global Dystopias, the anthology, um, and uh, the Resist anthology. All of these are books that are collecting short stories that are about gender or about race, um, imagining sort of alternate past and alternate futures that we can strive towards. Oh, that's nice. That's awesome. Um, yeah, that sounds like good stuff. So, And we could definitely provide the links to those if Dominique yeah, yeah. is so... Uh, be able to get them for me i'll, I'll definitely provide the links because I, yeah. I think that's actually you know i think everyone needs to be heard I, everyone has a right to be heard and um it's important that you know people broaden their horizons and you know hear everyone's story yeah most of i mean and that's kind of what cypher unlimited is all about you know it's kind of our thing you know <laughs> we're, 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 we were i was the original minority in this type of thing, you know, never even thinking about, you know, uh, you know, our, my, my, my transgender friends or, you know, you know, things like that. Just me being a black guy, you know, playing RPGs in the seventies, you know, was crazy stuff, you know, and now to see it progress so far, it does my heart good. And it's wonderful to see, you know, people like yourself here that I can reach out to because I need to learn. I have to learn. I, there, there are ideas and idioms that I just don't know. I can't say I'm uncomfortable, but I just don't know. Yeah. So, you know, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Once again. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, uh, so 
what can we look forward to, you know, from Dominique Dickey in the future? You know, do you have any projects you want to, you know, plug early or anything you want to tell us about? Uh, there's Trial that'll be out later this summer. Um, sea of Legends, which uh, I will get you the release date for that if I can find it. Um, what else am I working on? Um, got my thesis in the works, which will someday be available to the public <laughs> if you want to read about um, my experiences looking for my identity in fiction and trying to find characters who live like me and love like me and experience gender like me. Um, and I'm extremely loud on Twitter at Dom S. Dickey, and that's the best way to stay up on what I'm doing. Honestly, <laughs> is just like I yell on Twitter about everything that's exciting. <laughs> awesome. If it's happening, it's on Twitter. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> um, those were the easy questions, okay? Yeah. You, know, okay. you got All right. Let's go. <laughs> you you got the easy questions out of here. You know, this is our rapid fire question section. Here's where we dig deep into your soul. We pull out your essence. We stretch it. <laughs> We stretch it across the table for the whole world to see. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Ow. Yeah. All right. So, player or GM? Player. Pull punches or TPK? Ooh. <laughs> <coughs> I can't choose. Shit. Um. <laughs> <laughs> We've definitely had people say a little bit of both, so that's not a, that's not an invalid yeah, answer. Like, oh, <laughs> all right. I'll kill the party, but you know I'll give you bandages afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> online or in person gaming? I'm really into online lately. Online. Announce the difficulty number or keep it a secret. Announce it. I announce it because I can't do math, and the players do it for me. <laughs> Make salty or sweet snacks at the gaming table? Salty. Chips and salsa every day. Yeah, I'm a salty guy myself. RP or combat? RP. PDFs or physical books? PDFs because you can search. <laughs> <laughs> Pen and but paper? The oh. smell of paper. <laughs> yeah. Pen and paper notes or digital notes? Both. I do my pre game notes digitally and then my during game notes on paper. Pre written adventures or original content? Original content. Nice. Oh. Nice. I <laughs> I did it. Okay. Yeah, you, yeah, survived. you made it through. You made it through. She did it excellent. Those were hard. Yeah. <laughs> but um so you know, um that brings us to the end of our interview, you know, and all of that. It was so nice having you on the show. Guys, any final thoughts before we start closing everything out? Um, I just want to say that um, I, I saw the interview you did with Darcy, and then I read your adventure. And, you know, I must admit, I, I wasn't that aware of you, but not that I, I'm aware of your works. But I, after this, you know, getting to talk to you, I'm really intrigued to see what you have going on in the future. And I'm a, wholeheartedly support everything you do because you're a wonderful person and i could just by talking to you you know for this last hour i could see how genuine you are and you know that's all you could ask from anybody it's and um i'm a fan so thank you so much thank you <laughs> yeah um basically my my sentiments are the same you know um it's it's awesome to see you working so hard um to try to you know broaden people's horizons as anthony said earlier or, you know try to change perspectives or give people that added perspective to what's actually going on you know in these communities and whatever have you um so yeah you know just keep up the awesome work thank you so much for coming on and uh yeah thank you thank you for having me thank you yeah. and and so i guess it's just unanimous safe run limited is mm -hmm. now you know happily in love with dominique dickey and will support her <laughs> you know uh we're gonna just you know, continue to look at your works. You know, I follow you on Twitter. You know, I'm kind of a lurker on Twitter. I still haven't got my my Twitter feet, you know, together. But yeah, definitely follow them. You know, follow Dominique Diggy. Everybody out there, they are an awesome person. And you know, it's just been our pleasure tonight. So that's it. I, I know. Me, I know everybody out there in the web. 
um, loves Dominique, but if you like us and you like what we do, you you could join the Cypher Unlimited Discord server. We have 3,200 members and growing. And yes, we have games being played every day. I said every day. So if you want to play Cypher System, you want to chat about Cypher System, you want to talk about Cypher System, or any of the other wonderful games that Monty Cook Games does, such as Invisible Sun, No Thank You Evil, we are the site for you. And if you want us to support us in other ways, we also have a Kofi set up and an online store where you can get this cool Cypher Unlimited swag like me and Dean got on. <laughs> Please go to those sites too. Like we always say in every one of our videos, our videos will always be free. We, we um, what you call it, we do these videos so we can meet awesome people like Dominique, Shana Jermaine and everyone else that we've interviewed in the past year. But it helps us cover some small costs like Zoom costs and stuff like that. But either way, all this is optional. You don't have to do anything. Our, our videos will always be free. And like always, we want to just say we love you guys. Yep, yep. Um, and again, uh, thank you everybody for watching. Thank you, Dominique, for coming on. Um, we'll be sure to include all the links of the mentioned things down below, whether it be uh, Dominique's Twitter, um, you know, uh, the Sea of Legends game, all, all that stuff, trial, all that sort of information will be down below in the description. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much again for watching. Thank you so much again for coming on, Dominique. It's been a pleasure. And, uh, yeah, from us at the CU, we will see you later. Bye.